Praise the Lord, everybody. This is Brother Devon again. Uh, we're going to talk uh, a lot right now about what it means to be mortified. I think it is important for us to talk about mortification because it is actually a huge part of being a, a good Christian and an effective Christian, right? There are things that we can do in moderation. There's things that we can't do in moderation. And there are things that we can do if we do them the way the Bible says we are allowed to, in agreement and in accordance with what God's word says, right? And to be mortified in the, the dictionary, is in the transitive form, it talks about to discipline one's body, appetites, etc., so you discipline your body, your appetites, and everything pertaining to those two things. Also, you, the way you do it is you do it by suppressing desires and practicing abstinence. Now, I'm reading it not word for word. I'm reading it with my inference, but I'm going to have a description up in the... I'm going to have the... The, the definition up so you can read it word for word but it is to discipline one's body appetites etc by suppressing desires to practice abstinence and then it goes on in the definition to talk about the transitive usually used passively is to embarrass to humiliate, to injure one's dignity. And then I'll just keep going into what they call the obsolete transitive, which means it's not necessarily used in that manner anymore. But the obsolete transitive means to kill, to reduce the potency of, to nullify, to deaden, neutralize. One of the words that I want to highlight in that definition is humiliate. I believe we talked in my last video. I'm not sure if I posted this one before that one or that one before this one. But either way, one of the videos, we talked about how humiliation doesn't mean embarrassment. <clears throat> it doesn't mean shamefulness. Now, there can be a level of embarrassment and shamefulness in humiliation but humiliation is the process of being made humble so when you are humiliated it is the process that you go through to be made humble that is humiliate humble humiliation right <clears throat> So what this is talking about is, and I, I'm, I made it a point to leave, to add those definitions, because you know how whenever you read in the dictionary, there's always several definitions for every word. I made sure to add those definitions because they are very relevant to what we're talking about. And oftentimes you'll find that when you read scriptures, that the definition that the for the word that we use today, the way that we use the word today is not necessarily the way the word was used during the time of the translation from the word uh, from the Bible into the, the English language. That word may not have been used in that same context. So you have to look through many of the definitions to get a deeper understanding of what the writers were trying to convey to the people of God. Amen. So. When you read these, you start to get a really under, uh, a deeper understanding of what it means to be mortified. And, and I'm pretty sure somebody's probably wondering, what, where did you even get mortified from? What is that? Why are you even deciding to talk about mortification? What does that even, where does that even come from? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's look in Romans chapter 8. We're going to read uh, chapter 8, verse 12 through verse 14. And it says, Therefore, brethren... We are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So right there, obviously, you can see that when we're in verse 13, we're talking about 
mortifying the deeds of the body. We want to talk about this because I feel like there's not enough emphasis on mortifying the deeds of the body when we are going through our daily Christian walk. We're going through day-to-day life. We don't hear people talk about that very much. Um, We hear people talk about the blessings. We hear people talk about how God brought them through. Um, But we don't hear enough about how people say, I had to bring my flesh under subjection today five times. I had to bring my flesh under subjection today 27 times. Matter of fact, all day long, I had to constantly remind myself to be under subjection to the will of God and see a lot of times it it makes the the walk of of Christianity look like it's uh, uh, um, an oppressive thing it makes the the walk of Christianity look like it's something where it's maybe not something that I want to be a part of or, or you know if I'm somebody who's looking at it I have to constantly kill myself if we look back at the definition I have to embarrass humiliate injure my own dignity to kill or reduce the potency of my own flesh to nullify the deeds of my flesh and to deaden or neutralize the deeds that are within me and then if we go back up to the, the original definition, to discipline my body and appetites. I have to constantly keep my body and appetites in discipline. You see, it's, it's one of those things where that's why the Bible talks about how we die daily. That is what this, this is all about. We are supposed to die to who we are. And I know I think I've said this in probably two or three videos already, but I I, I really, I really feel uh, it in my spirit that this is something that we need to talk about in the body. We need to talk about this. So if you're watching this, you need to hear about it. There's a reason why I'm saying this. We need to die in this flesh in order to live like Christ. We have to die to some of our desires, to some of our our thought processes. We have to di- we have to die to a lot of our appetites, our fleshly appetites. There are things, and I'm not, not going to spend all day pointing out the several the, the the all the things that it could be because I would literally be here for an hour talking about all the things. But you, whoever you are watching this, you know the things in your life. You know the things in your body, in your mind that are pulling you further away from God that are taking you further away from the presence of God, that are causing you to be an enemy of God. You know what those things are, and you know that you can work on those things. And it is a difficult process. I really hate the songs that say, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before, because every day with Jesus is tough. Every day with Jesus is not is not roses and 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 honeycombs and all that stuff. It's 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 really not. It's it gets sweeter because you fall in love more with him. It gets sweeter because you 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 learn to cherish who he is and what he means to you. But it is not sweeter from the standpoint that you are dying to who you are and you no longer <clears throat> want to be the individual that you are. You know, like, oh, man, it's, it seems so difficult, so hard. It seems so, so troubling. Uh, it may seem like a very miserable walk. It may seem like something that is very, very miserable. But in actuality, it's not because our hope is not based in this life. Our hope is based in something far beyond anything this life can present to us. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, it says, Brethren, for ye have been called unto liberty, Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. What is that saying? That's letting us know that we have liberty in this walk. walk. So don't think of this walk as an oppressive way. But the thing of it is, we cannot use that liberty and that freedom for an occasion to the flesh as a means to glorify the flesh, as a means to puff up the flesh or give the flesh the desires that it wants instead of giving God the desires that he has. And he desires our whole being. He desires our whole devotion that we can offer to him. And if our devotion is being partially given out to our desires, then we can't give it all to God. 
if our if our devotion is being given out to the pleasures that we like it, whether and I don't want to keep start calling like I said before I don't want to call out things because then I'll you know but if it's towards whatever that thing is that you love that whatever that thing is that you spend time doing whatever that thing and it has no godly purpose go no godly uh I think I, I in my last video was talking about seek first, and so I'm I'm still in that same theme. That's still I'm still in that same vein of thinking. We have to mortify the deeds that are within our flesh. We have to look past what our desires are in this body, that our desires are in this flesh, and we have to suppress those things. And and I hate um, when we have these discussions and we don't give a solution, right? It's easy for me to sit here and say, we have to suppress, we have to mortify the deeds of the flesh. We have to, you know, not use them for an occasion of the, uh, of the body or of the flesh. How, but how, Brother Damon, how do we do that? How do I uh, conquer that thing? How do I overcome that? Okay, so first, it is just like with everything that you have to conquer and overcome. You have to first admit that there is something there. And that is, that is a huge battle. Many of us live in a state of denial. We live in a deluded state where we really do believe that there are less problems in within us that we generate for ourselves than there actually are. So we, we try to pretend like, oh, well, it's probably not that bad. The, the fornication that I do is probably not that bad. The drunkardness that I find myself in is probably not that bad. The hate, the envy that I stir up, the lying that I do, the backbiting. I mean, like I said, I didn't want to get into all these, but all the things that I do, the ego and all, I, <clears throat> those things aren't that bad. You know, there's people that's worse than me. Listen, beloved of God, children of God, there are always going to be people who are worse than you. They are not the measuring stick. They are not the ones by whom we are to look to, to, to say if we are right or wrong, or if we're justified or not. There will always be people worse than you. So never look to your brother and your sister or to those in the world as justification. I remember I heard a, a young lady talking once and she was talking about her dress wear. And she was trying to justify to her parents that what she was wearing wasn't so bad because the girls in school were way worse than her. And her father almost blew a gasket. Like, uh, what does that have to do with you that they're worse? So because they don't have parental guidance, all of a sudden I shouldn't be a good father? It is that same principle, that same concept. Just because somebody else may be worse off than you doesn't mean that you are to the standard that you are supposed to be at and you know the standard that you are supposed to be at you may not know all the details of where god wants you you may not know all the dimensions where god wants to take you to and you may not understand all of his will for you but you do know the things that you could be doing better and how do we do that first you identify identify the problem and to whatever that problem is, you have to start reduction. So whatever the problem may be, you begin with reduction. You begin to reduce that thing. So one of my problems is eating. I love to eat. That is one of the things I, I, I you don't look this good without eating. Praise God. And uh, <laughs> so, so I have to start reducing the amount that I eat. And then pretty soon I had to start changing what it is that I eat in order to start getting the effect that I wanted. Yes, it's been a long process. Yes, it's been difficult. Yes, it's been humbling. Yes, it's been embarrassing. Yes, it's been frustrating. But it is a process that I have to go through to get to the result that I want. I have to mortify the desires and the things in my flesh in order to get where I want to be. If you want to be in a deeper place and a higher level, uh, whatever it is that you want from God, wherever it is you want to be in God, you have to start with these steps, admitting that there's a problem. I looked in the mirror for years and I realized, good God Almighty, I've gained some weight. 
And then after I made that realization, then I had to realize there was something that needed to be done. Then I had to get the willpower. And so it starts the process. And that's what we have to do. And then what we have to do is we have to start looking for more we have to get into research and finding better ways to apply what we're doing so that way it'll be more effective for us. What does that mean? So even in, in the case, if we're going to keep using me as our, you know, as our guide or whatever, not only did I have to change what I was eating, not only did I have to change and reduce the amount that I was eating, I had to figure out why I was even eating it. I had to figure out why I felt the need to eat so much. I had to figure out why it was that I was being triggered to do that. And then I had to change those things in my life that made me feel that way. You see what I'm saying? It is a process of mortification. See, the things that you may be doing or the things that you may find yourself in, there's a reason why you have adjusted your life to allow such things to happen. And you have to readjust your life to take yourself out of those things and to change who you are, to change that character, to change that being, that person that you have become. And if you're not really willing or, or, or able or ready to start making those changes, then things can't change for you. Where you are in God, where you are in your walk may be a stagnant place that you will be at for a long time. And there's nothing worse than looking back 10 years and saying, man, I've been the same place that I've been for 10 years. I have very little growth. I have very little movement. I'm in a stagnant place. I'm in uh, essentially a bog. I'm in a rut. Nothing worse than that. So in, in order to keep yourself from being in that spiritual rut, from being in that spiritual bog, you've got to be willing to make radical changes. You cannot expect God to take you to different places and different dimensions when you refuse to be a different person. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 12, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 23, they almost say the same thing, but at the end, Paul changes it up just a little bit. And it says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Paul is letting us know that that, uh, well, that same thing we were just talking about with that liberty. All things are lawful for us. We are allowed to do so many things, right? But all things are not expedient. All things are not purposeful. And matter of fact, let's just go to the, the definition of expedient. The definition of expedient is suitable to affect some desired end or purpose intended. Now, I use the word purposeful because it's just a lot easier than saying all of that. But all things are not purposeful. All things are not suitable to affect the desired end. If your desired end is to be more like Christ, then some of these things that you may be doing that you, you may say, you know what? It's not really all that bad. It's not really that big of a deal. Uh, you know, it's, it's only hurting me. It's only affecting me. I'm not doing this to anybody else. This is uh, my choice, my decision, you know, uh, you know, my body, my home, my car, my whatever. This is what I've decided to do for my life. It may be lawful for you to do that because you have the right. You are a, a free moral agent. But it is not purposeful to the end goal. And the end goal is not only just to be like Christ, but the end goal is to dwell with Christ. And so that is the that is the end result. And so when you start to think of that end result and that majesty and that glory, you start to realize that some of these things are so unimportant they're so trivial and so minuscule and so uh, purposeless and so we have to focus 
on mortification, being mortified. And I still haven't read 23. And 23 says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. What is edify? Edify means to build, construct. In the transitive, it means to instruct or improve morally or intellectually. So Paul just dropped two heavy, heavy ones on us. Heavy load, heavy load. <laughs> Paul just dropped two, two heavy ones on us with these, these verses in Corinthians. <clears throat> All things are lawful. In other words, we're allowed to do these things. But all things do not instruct us, improve us. They don't build us up. They don't construct us. They don't improve us morally or intellectually. I think it would be purposeful for all of us, whenever we're doing something that is our habit, our routine, to try to step back and apply some of these definitions and some of these scriptures to whatever that thing is, right? Whatever it may be, just, just accept the challenge. Accept this challenge. Write down some of these scriptures. Write down some of these definitions. Put them on a, a three by five card or something to that effect or put them in your notes in your phone. And when you're doing whatever that thing may be, when you're making that text, when you're meeting that individual, when you're purchasing that thing, when you're going down that road, when you, whatever the case may be, when you're making that decision, reflect on these things and say, is this lawful? Yes, this is probably lawful. I should be, I'm probably allowed to do this to some degree. Um, is this biblically allowed? Mm, maybe not. Well, who knows, right? Okay, so let's just say, let's say I don't know the word that well. And that's, that's what a lot of people's excuses. Well, I don't know the word that well. I don't know the Bible that well. I don't know if this is right or wrong or not. But, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a preacher. I'm just, you know, I just believe there is a God. That's kind of their excuse, right? So let's go past all of that. Let's say this. Does this thing edify me? What does that mean? Does this thing build me or construct me? Does this thing instruct me? Does this improve me morally or intellectually? And if it doesn't, should I be doing it? Is it doing it spiritually? Is this building me up spiritually, improving me spiritually, making me closer to God or, or Christ, building me up? Probably not. Uh, is this suitable? Is this purposeful? Is this thing really purposeful? Is this anything beyond my basic desires? Is what I'm doing anything beyond? I, there's there's a thing that I, I often talk about, and I mean this this little tidbit might you know turn a lot of people off, but it just is what it is. There's a thing that I talk about when when when, when women wear all their excessive uh, makeup and, and and jewelry and all those type of things. I often ask them. With that thing, is there any other purpose to that besides vanity? Is there any other reason for that other than you to say, well, I feel good and I look good and I'm, I'm proud of myself. I, is, there, if there's, is there any other reason? Are you hiding some deformity? If that is the case, I understand. Are you covering up some, you know, dysfunction or something like that? I understand that. But if the only reason that you have to do that is just for your vanity, just because you want to yield to vanity, because you want to look better, you want to feel or be prettier, does that edify your soul? Does that make your soul better? You make the decision yourself. You are a free moral agent. You you are very well capable of understanding right from wrong or whatever the case may be. But apply that logic to everything. Is this for any other reason than just to please my flesh? Well, I hope that blessed you. Uh, that was in my spirit, in my mind. Uh, 
wouldn't let me sleep. I'm talking kind of soft because it's kind of late. Um, matter of fact, it's very late. Um, so I pray that this uh, video finds you well. And I pray that we said something in this video that uh, ministers to your heart and helps you to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Thank you.